Disclaimer, this video was made purely for documentary purposes in order to educate and entertain viewers. As is made self-evident in the video, I in no way condone nor celebrate any of the organizations or people depicted herein. The events depicted in the next presentation were heavily researched and are backed by primary and secondary sources that corroborate the information presented. I in no way intend to make light or promote the acts depicted, but simply intend to share these historical events with the general public. Thank you. It has been said time and time again, and I will say it again today. Covert wars require covert funding. Throughout the history of the CIA, the agency required vast and dependable sources of unaccountable cash to fund their secret actions across the globe. And as it turns out, feeding, arming, training, and supplying guerrilla armies is quite expensive. So, as the CIA expanded its global program following its creation in 1947, the agency developed a strategy that would replicate itself throughout the rest of its history. By using the global narcotics trade as an ideal vector of funds, separate from their taxpayer-funded budget, the Central Intelligence Agency would arm, fund, and support underground armies and secret wars around the world. In the early 1950s, the Cold War was in full swing, and decolonization across the Global South put pressure on the strained European and American imperial powers. During this period of tension and unrest, one of history's most famous narcotics trade routes was established, the French Connection. Today we'll be starting the long, winding journey of tracking the establishment of the real French Connection, in the late 40s and throughout the 1950s. This will be a globe-trotting miniseries, split into three main theatres. We will be starting today and in the next episode in Southeast Asia, where the French Connection started, where American and French intelligence agencies worked to empower narco-fueled warlords in the fallout of the Chinese Civil War, and in an effort to counter the newly victorious People's Republic of China, as well to counter the nascent revolutionary movement in Vietnam and Laos, which threatened France's colonial hold on the region. Next, we will be returning to France and unraveling the CIA's support of the Corsican mob in the south of the country, allowing for the establishment of Marseille as Europe's opium capital and a crucial trade vector between the opium-producing regions in the east and the major urban markets of the United States in the west. Finally, in the final section of this expose, we will be returning to North America to explore the integration of this network in the domestic United States and the emergence of Cuba as a critical hub for illegal activity and organized crime. Throughout this series, we will explore the nuances of the French connection, the development of modern counterinsurgency models, the development of a narco funding model that is perpetuated to this day, and the emergence of Southeast Asia and Latin America as key battlegrounds in the Cold War. Welcome back to Eyes Wide Open and the history of the CIA YouTube series. If it is your first time coming across one of my videos, I want to welcome you to my channel. I recommend that first time viewers stick with this video right now and watch it first, as I make all my videos as standalone products, and as we are starting a new miniseries, this should be a great introduction to my documentary style. If you enjoyed this video and want more, I have 7 more parts of this series on my YouTube channel. As always, I cite all my sources in the description of every video. Whenever you see a number at the top of the screen like this, you will find a matching bibliographic citation below that indicates where I sourced that information. I did a lot of digging for this part and hope you take the time to check out some of the authors that I've linked below. Some of their books and articles are truly fascinating. For this part, I owe a massive debt to Dr. Alfred McCoy for his 1972 magnum opus, The Politics of Heroin. McCoy's painstaking work sourcing primary interviews on location in Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and France, later in Afghanistan and Central America, allowed him to create one of the most complete and detailed accounts of the CIA's complicity in the global drug trade. His work remains heavily cited to this day by researchers and authors, and I believe that his five decades old work still stands as the touchstone for intelligence narcotics connections, at least before Iran-Contra. I also want to mention Douglas Valentine's The Strength of the Wolf. This piece provides an encyclopedic account of American law enforcement and the CIA's work with global organized crime elements. Valentine tracks the gradual infusion of mob elements into these agencies in a brilliantly detailed work. It is a dense and invaluable source for this type of research, and I will be citing from it throughout the French Connection series. Well, without further ado, let's travel to post-war Southeast Asia, where the French Connection begins in the hills of the Golden Triangle. Let's begin. I will do my level best to stand up for freedom and democracy around the world by keeping the United States of America strong and by keeping our eyes wide open.
as we welcome change in the world by keeping our eyes wide open. Before we get into the intelligence operations in Southeast Asia, I want to situate us in terms of geography before we dive deep into CIA activities in Southeast Asia and the First Indochina War. We will be covering a lot of ground in space during this section, so I think it will be valuable to look at a map and highlight the regions that we will be covering. On screen now is a map of French Indochina and the neighboring countries of Thailand and Burma. Burma has since been renamed to Myanmar. French Indochina today is split into three independent nation states, the country of Vietnam on the east coast, and the largest of the three, the country of Cambodia to the southwest, and the landlocked country of Laos in the highlands of the northwest. Nestled within this subcontinent is an important region that is not shown on typical world maps. The area in the northern highlands of Burma, Thailand, and modern-day Laos is known colloquially as the Golden Triangle. The term Golden Triangle is fairly new, with author Pierre Arnaud Chauvy claiming that it was coined by U.S. Vice Secretary of State Marshall Green during a 1971 press conference. The Golden of the Golden Triangle, of course, likely refers to the massive economic importance of the region. This specific area highlighted on screen right now was a major opium growing region during the colonial era, when the European colonial governments enjoyed monopolies on opium sales. It was not until the global prohibition regimes of the 1920s that opium cultivation became taboo, as it was simply seen as another cash crop during the colonial period. Yet prohibition simply shifted the legitimate production of opioids to the underworld of organized crime and narco states. This continued production of opium was exemplified by the massive boom in production in the Golden Triangle during the Cold War. From the 1950s to the 1990s, the Golden Triangle would become the most important opium producing region in the world, eventually being overtaken by Afghanistan in the often overlooked Golden Crescent region in the Middle East. The Golden Triangle would be the major focus of today's expose. When observing this region, we can also add the southern Chinese state of Yunnan, an instrumental opium field for the Chinese government before the Communist Party of China undertook their anti-opium campaigns of the early 1950s and 1960s. Clearing out the opium growers from the state of Yunnan was not a harmonious or simple task, as it took four anti-opium campaigns undertaken in 1952, 1954, 1964 and 1965 to finally substantially curb the cultivation and consumption of opium in the southern Chinese state. Also important to note are the Burmese state of Shan, which is indicated on screen, as well as northern Thailand and northern Laos. These will be of critical importance to the events outlined in today's episode and the next. Another important insight to highlight before we dive in is that the entire subcontinent of Southeast Asia was and remains to this day a complex tapestry of cultures and peoples that were amalgamated into these distinct fabricated colonial borders. Much like the modern Middle Eastern political geography, which is defined by the Sykes-Picot lines drawn up in the early 20th century, Southeast Asia features divisions that are often incongruent with the local populations and cultures within their borders. As the Western intelligence agencies fought against the anti-colonial and communist movements in the region, they worked to isolate specific minority cultures to fight the revolutionary advances on their behalf. One particularly important group were the Hmong people in the highlands of Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam, crucially within the Golden Triangle region. The Hmong found themselves in a difficult predicament as a minority group spread amongst three different countries, without a majority status in any of the distinct nation states. Due to this fact, and of course, the Hmong's traditional place as poppy farmers in the highlands, this group was employed in Laos by French intelligence and the CIA to resist the rising Viet Minh in Vietnam and the path at Lao in Laos. Additionally, there were also the Hoi people of Yunnan, a Muslim minority group in southern China and eastern Burma. According to Pierre Arnaud Chauvy, the Hoi people were outsiders in the region, originally descendants of Uzbek cultures. The Hoi were originally pushed into eastern Burma between 1856 and 1873 by the Chinese Empire, following the Panthe Revolt in southern China. The Hoi people were a comparatively small minority group in the southern state of Yunnan and the Shan state of Burma. This minority status forced them to embrace opium cultivation for subsistence. Again, much like the Hmong in Laos, the Hoi did not have their own state and found themselves as outsiders within the countries they inhabited. 
American intelligence would support the Hoi-dominated KMT breakaway in Burma to attempt a counter-invasion of China following the exile of the nationalists to Taiwan in 1949. We will get to the Hoi today, and the next part of this series we will focus on the Hmong. I just figured that a broad geographic overview would help situate ourselves in this complex geopolitical region. American intelligence began their involvement in Southeast Asia in the waning years of the Second World War. The Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS for short, was the wartime predecessor to the CIA and was where many future CIA men would start their careers. We spoke briefly about OSS Detachment 202 in the prelude episode of this series, which I recommend you check out after this video if you want more background information. Detachment 202 in China in northern Burma was led by one Colonel Paul Heliwell. The important takeaway about Heliwell's time in China during the war was that he witnessed the use of illicit drugs as an off-the-books funding source for the nationalist KMT guerrilla forces in Yunnan. Heliwell's colleagues later claimed in a now infamous quote in a 1980 Wall Street Journal article that Heliwell gathered information during the war with five pound shipments of opium or, quote, three sticky brown bars, according to one testimony. This specific strategic insight would be critical to the CIA's counterinsurgency strategy across the world for the rest of its history, a history that Heliwell would be deeply embedded in. Heliwell will arguably be the main character of this miniseries, and will feature prominently as the architect of the American side of the French connection, and in turn, the pioneer of narcotics-fueled counterinsurgency. For our story today, we begin in 1950, five years after the end of the Second World War. The Cold War was entering its hottest years, as the Chinese Civil War ended with a communist victory in 1949. Mao's guerrilla forces had successfully outmaneuvered Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist army and forced them into retreat. Chiang and a contingency of his forces were able to escape the mainland and take exile on the island of Taiwan, where they would establish the Republic of China. This bitter upset put on full display the true power of insurgency movements at outlasting and defeating cumbersome and expensive organized armies. Although the KMT had seemingly lost the mainland, their struggle for control of China would continue for the following decades. Several KMT divisions were cut off from Taiwan and remained deeply embedded in the Chinese heartland. One of these divisions was that of General Li Mi in the southern Chinese province of Yunnan, within the Golden Triangle. Incidentally, where Heliwell operated during the war. General Lee was forced to retreat, bringing the remaining troops from the 93rd Division, 26th Army, and 8th Army across China's southern border into neighboring Burma and French Indochina. The French quickly dealt with the 5,000 or so KMT soldiers that crossed into northern Laos, and they were eventually repatriated to Taiwan. However, in Burma, they found much more success, as Li used Burma as a staging ground to regroup, set up camps, and prepare a new offensive into the Chinese mainland. It is important to note that the majority of Li's men were comprised of the Hui people from the province of Yunnan. This ethnic group had for the past century sustained themselves by growing opium and supplying the thriving opium dens of Bangkok. This lucrative trade had likely funded the operations of the Yunnan troops during the Chinese Civil War. Now cut off from the government in Taipei, and stuck between the communist forces in China and the Burmese army to his west, Li Mi was desperate for support. In response to his defeat in the Chinese Civil War, Chiang Kai-shek and his powerful China lobby in Washington, D.C. got to work pushing for American involvement in Asia. To this point, the Truman administration had been fairly ambivalent towards the Chinese Civil War and the ongoing conflicts in Southeast Asia. This ambivalence quickly vanished when Mao's forces took control of the mainland and the anti-colonial struggle in French Indochina grew more radical and effective. In April 1950, Truman was alerted of the growing importance of Southeast Asia as a battleground of the Cold War by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They stated the need for a, quote, program of special covert operations designed to interfere with communist activities in Southeast Asia, end quote, essentially calling for the development of counterinsurgency strategies in the region. But it was not until November 1950, when the Chinese Red Army crossed the Yalu River in the evolving Korean War, pushing the South Korean and UN troops southwards, that Washington power brokers decided to take a decisive stance in Southeast Asia. Truman was in luck, because Frank Wisner, at the Office of Policy Coordination, or the OPC for short, which was the CIA's covert operations arm, had already been working on a plan for Southeast Asia. And this plan involved a small contingent of KMT troops trapped in Burma, under the command of the man, Lee Mi. 
Although Truman was largely aloof of the rising importance of East Asia in the growing Cold War until the decisive events of 1950, a year earlier, in the George Washington Hotel in D.C., an informal meeting was held that would ensure the CIA could intervene in the doomed civil war in China. Frank Wisner, the son of a southern aristocratic family and head of the Office of Policy Coordination at the new CIA, met with Claire Cheneau an American Chinese expat who led the Flying Tigers, a mercenary air force that supported the nationalist Chinese forces during the Chinese Civil War. Cheneau was desperate during this time. He knew that Chiang Kai-shek's forces were fighting a losing battle in China, and his Flying Tigers, which had been reorganized into the civilian airline Civil Air Transport, lay on the brink of bankruptcy. He was looking for a benefactor to save his airline and potentially help the KMT secure some sort of foothold against Mao's forces. Cheneau had already approached the State Department for support, and received a cold and disinterested response. According to Alfred McCoy, Cheneau then approached Paul Helliwell, the former OSS colonel in China, for assistance. Helliwell had transitioned out of the OSS and into the CIA right at its inception in 1947. He was based for much of his career in Miami, Florida, where he would eventually be a partner at a successful law firm that would provide services to CIA-affiliated businesses and enterprises throughout the early Cold War. Cheneau and Helliwell, both Americans in China during World War II, surely knew each other and both understood the value of civil air transport to the evolving situation in Southeast Asia. So, Helliwell did what any good friend would do, and referred Cheneau to Frank Wisner, the main covert operations man at the CIA's newly integrated covert operating arm, the Office of Policy Coordination. The OPC has a strange history. It was created in 1948 under NSC 102, authorized by Truman, and it started as a completely independent body within the CIA. Separate from the main brass and reporting directly to the State Department, it found itself in a uniquely independent position. Reportedly, Frank Wisner ran the OPC as his own fiefdom, running operations that were often completely unknown to other CIA men outside of his office. The OPC's independence was short-lived, however, as the CIA's new director, appointed in October 1950, General Walter Beadle Smith, worked to consolidate the OPC under the CIA's main power structure. Wisner was now constrained by the comparatively restrained vision of old General Smith, who himself was a military man, having worked as Eisenhower's chief of staff in Europe during World War II. He then served as President Truman's ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1946 to 1948, before being appointed to the Director of Central Intelligence role in 1950. It is important to note that Walter Beadle Smith was the last of the military leaders of the CIA for the next two and a half decades. Following his replacement by his Deputy Director Alan Dulles in 1953, the CIA would then be led by mostly company men for the rest of its history. Of course, military men would come and go from the DCI position for short blips, but most of the rest of the CIA's history was dominated by true spies, mostly lawyers and business elites turned into international cloak and dagger agents. But for the time being, Walter Beadle Smith was in charge of the CIA, and Frank Wisner was determined to maintain his autonomy in his consolidated OPC. As he sat across from Claire Cheneau in the George Washington Hotel, a perfect opportunity arose for him to expand the CIA's operation in Asia and to counter the Red Army's rapid advances in China. This chance meeting, organized by Paul Helliwell, marked the beginning of the CIA's air campaign in Southeast Asia. Cheneau, desperate for funds, was surprised by Wisner's agreement to fund the civil air transport, and by March 1950, the CIA was funding CAT to the tune of $1 million a year. And shortly after this, in August of the same year, the CIA bought civil air transport outright for a little under a million dollars. Although the nationalist KMT forces were doomed in mainland China and would retreat four months after the OPC subsidy was paid to Cheneau, civil air transport would undoubtedly be a useful tool to future CIA operations in the subcontinent. General Li Mi waited in the jungles of Burma. Frank Wisner, Paul Helliwell, and Harry Truman answered his calls. Not to be confused with Operation Paperclip, Operation Paper was a little-known CIA operation that mainly operated in Burma and Thailand roughly between the years of 1951 and 1952. Following the CIA sponsorship of civil air transport, Claire Cheneau returned to Asia, 
I want to highlight first and foremost a fantastic primary source that I came across that helps illuminate this history. Alfred Cox wrote a history paper prepared for the Director of Central Intelligence in 1967 that has since been declassified, but unfortunately remains heavily redacted. Alfred Cox was an OSS agent in the China Theater and was the official CIA liaison at CAT. Alfred McCoy calls Cox a, quote, guerrilla expert. And as far as a primary source goes, Cox's paper is as good as it gets. Although the account is fairly whitewashed and unfortunately, as I said earlier, heavily redacted, especially a section where Cox lists out all the operational aid provided by civil air transport to the CIA's activities, we still get some very valuable insights. He highlights specifically NSC 342, which was a policy proposal by the National Security Council that was approved by Truman on March 3, 1949. Essentially, NSC 342 paved the way for Operation Paper, as it cemented Washington's covert role in China by stating, quote, Our principal reliance in combating Kremlin influence in China should, however, be on the activities of indigenous Chinese elements, end quote. Of course, when looking for indigenous Chinese elements to support, Li Mi and his guerrilla army in eastern Burma came to mind. Interestingly, Alfred Cox and Claire Cheneau were personally close with Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. In his history paper, Cox outlines several meetings held between CAT officials and the KMT leadership in Taiwan throughout the late 1940s and early 1950s. During this period, the CAT was essentially operating as a private shipping airline for the nationalists out of Taiwan. Frank Wisner at the OPC was looking for any way to support the nationalists in their last-ditch effort to fend off the communists. And at this intersection, Operation Paper was born. Operation Paper was essentially an airlift operation, aiming to secretly arm the breakaway forces of Li Mi in Burma, while maintaining the United States obligations as an ostensible neutral power within the Civil War. What is unique about Operation Paper in the history of the CIA is that it is one of the rare operations that enjoyed support from the White House while being opposed by the head of the CIA, Walter Beadle Smith. President Truman's support of Operation Paper needs to be contextualized. It is unclear whether he understood the full scope of the operation, which, as we will see, likely included a narcotic element. The OPC drafted proposal for the operation was brought forward by the Joint Chiefs of Staff in November 1950 and called for a vague provision of aid to Li Mi's 93rd Army to aid their reconquest of Yunnan. Truman, caught in an awkward position with the fall of China and the tides turning in Korea, was likely to approve any proposal to strike back at the communists or at least work to pull troops away from Korea in the tense year of 1950. This was the main goal of Operation Paper, which as Claire Cheneau would state later in his life, it was to trap China in quote, giant pincers, or two simultaneous offensives from Korea and from Burma. Peter Dale Scott also notes in his article in Operation Paper that Dean Acheson, Secretary of State for Truman, did not know of the operation and that the embassies in Thailand and Burma were also left in the dark until at least 1951. We will see later that embassy memos from both the Thai and Burmese embassies reinforce this fact. So it appears that Operation Paper was snuck through by Wisner at a time when Truman was desperate for any retaliation to the advancing Chinese. CIA Director Walter Beadle Smith's disapproval of the plan may seem a bit more puzzling. However, there appeared to be two main reasons why he was not in accordance with the Joint Chiefs in supporting the operation. Firstly, as previously mentioned, Smith was working to consolidate power over Wisner's OPC during this period, which he would eventually succeed in doing by 1952, consolidating the OPC under the new Directorate of Plans also under Frank Wisner. In 1950, however, it is likely that Beadle Smith viewed paper as another opportunity for the Office of Policy Coordination to continue to act independently of the CIA's main hierarchy, and thus he disapproved with the plan for bureaucratic reasons. Now, my personal perspective on this issue, and what I believe was the second reason Beadle Smith disapproved with paper, is that as a military man, he understood the glaring flaws within the logistics of the plan itself. Li Mi's forces were marginal compared to the rigid organization of the Red Army, especially the guerrilla forces that had occupied Yunnan after the KMT's exit. The KMT forces enjoyed little local popularity amongst the people in Yunnan, and were constantly being opposed by the Burmese government and people throughout their time in exile. Li Mi's forces had to rely on banditry and looting to remain active, which damaged any local support that his forces may have enjoyed. 
Important to note here is that the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, Walter Beadle Smith, the former army general, likely understood this reality and saw that with such a marginal contingency force and with little moral or local support, Lee Mee's incursion would likely fail, or at least hit some major roadblocks. Beadle Smith was also coming from the State Department, where he had acted as Truman's ambassador to the Soviet Union. Beadle likely also saw Operation Paper as a potential diplomatic crisis for the United States, and supporting non-state fighters in a foreign country. Ultimately, Operation Paper would become a diplomatic crisis as we will see later, and in the end, Walter Beadle Smith would be right in regards to the primary mission of invading southern China, as, spoiler alert, Operation Paper failed in that objective. However, Operation Paper did succeed in other ways that Walter Beadle Smith may not have been foreseeing. We will get to all that later. Although Beadle did not support Operation Paper, Truman's signature overrode his disagreement. Therefore, Operation Paper was a go, and Paul Helliwell, Alfred Cox, and another mysterious man named Willis Byrd got to work, and then in the next section we will see how these three men created the first CIA-supported narco army. Let's get into it. The CIA mostly ran Operation Paper out of Bangkok in Thailand, a significant base of covert operations for the CIA during this period and into the Vietnam War. Thailand was aligned with Japan during World War II, and served as a junior Axis member in the East. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Playek Phibun Songkram, who we will be referring to by his shortened name, simply Phibun, Thailand was reformed into a military dictatorship that aided Japan in seizing Western colonies throughout the war, reoccupying parts of French Indochina, such as sections of Laos and Cambodia, and parts of British Malaya and Burma. Eventually, as Japanese power declined and Western powers became more entrenched in Southern Asia, Phibun was ousted from Parliament and replaced with a Prime Minister that was sympathetic to the Free Thai Movement, which was Thailand's wartime resistance movement to the Phibun government. As the war came to a close in the Pacific, Thailand had a short period of democracy until 1947, when Phibun was returned to power. Under the new Phibun government, Thailand would be a critical ally to the Western powers, fighting decolonization movements and later, the First Indochina War. Prime Minister Phibun seized power alongside a clique of generals and warlords that called themselves the Coup Group, which is fairly unoriginal. Following the success of the 1947 coup, the plotters occupied senior roles in the Thai armed forces, and Phibun quickly became a mere figurehead behind the military government that possessed the true power of the state after the coup. The coup commander was Major General Finn Chun Hawan, who had recently acted as the commander of Thai forces occupying northern Thailand within the Golden Triangle. Finn was dependent on two key figures to maintain his control, two figures who would continue to vie for power for the next decade of Thai history. The first side of this rivalry was led by Marshal Sarit Thanarat, who was the army's commander-in-chief and represented the top of the conventional military brass. On the other end was General Fao Sianon, who was General Finn, the coup leader's son-in-law, and the corrupt deputy director of Thailand's National Police Force. Fao would become the main benefactor of US aid under the auspices of border security, which remained a threat as French and later US military advisors feared that Laotian guerrilla forces would seek refuge in neighboring Thailand. This was not an unfounded fear, given the porous and lightly protected borders in Southeast Asia at the time, as exemplified by Lee Mi's seamless entry into Burma following the fall of the KMT. Thailand was in many senses a US client state beginning in the early 1950s. This is according to Canadian academic Arna Klislenko in his paper detailing Thailand's role in Southeast Asian covert operations during the First and Second Indochina Wars, which I have linked below. In the article, he shares some useful figures that help illuminate the massive importance placed in Thailand by the US security state. He notes that between 1950 and 1975, some 650 million US dollars of aid were sent to Thailand, with 75% of that aid going towards counterinsurgency and counter guerrilla capabilities. An additional $950 million was spent on bolstering the Thai military, representing approximately 50% of all Thai military spending during the period. 80% of US bombing missions into Laos and northern Vietnam left from airstrips in Thailand. Most important to US interests, however, was the northwest of the country, which Kislenko claims was unstable and difficult for the Thai government to consolidate, due to it being the most remote region in the country, or as he puts it, the wild frontier. The borderland was also in proximity to the ever-important country of Laos, which posed an external threat of future Pathet Lao guerrillas penetrating the US-aligned Thai state. 
This difficulty was exacerbated by the complex ethnic makeup of the northwestern region itself, which featured a combination of Laotians, Vietnamese, and Hmong people that did not necessarily align with Thai nationalism. Of course, for the purposes of our video, this border region also represented the portion of Thailand that was within the Golden Triangle, and where Thai and Burmese opium traveled to reach the ports of Bangkok. This was furthered by the Phibun government authorizing poppy growing in the region in 1947, restarting the industry and providing an additional revenue source to the region and the government through the heavy taxation involved in the poppy industry. You will also note the proximity of this border region to Limi's forces in eastern Burma, making this an ideal vector to bringing Burmese opium to market. So due largely to all these factors, Operation Paper was not born in Burma, it was born in Thailand. Incidentally, Operation Paper likely supported Li Mi's poppy cultivation and opium exports as a way to guarantee that his force could operate independently and off the books, even after American funding ended. It is important to remember that Li Mi and the KMT were still technically engaged in a civil war, and were still not recognized as a national army. Therefore, direct US support of his forces through open channels was impossible. The opium funding strategy used to bolster the KMT forces in Burma would be used across the world throughout the rest of the CIA's history for two key reasons. Firstly, narco profits were inherently off the records and thus untraceable. American or Western support of these armies, funded by the narcotics trade, could easily be dismissed under plausible deniability, as there was no direct funding line between American officials and the forces supported. Secondly, and maybe more deviously, supporting a guerrilla army's narco funding strategy enabled the force to become essentially self-reliant. With Limi's forces, for example, the CIA only needed to give them a small nudge, a short spurt of military and financial aid through shell companies, which we will get to, to allow the forces to then develop their own self-sufficiency, in this case through the extremely lucrative narcotics trade, to then be able to conduct their operations independently and without any direct American support. This model would replicate itself around the world, wherever narcotics were available and paramilitary operations were required. We can see these same patterns in Afghanistan, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Laos for example. Although at its core it is deeply cynical and devastating in increasing drug consumption across the globe, this model still works brilliantly for funding guerrilla armies without official congressional approval. We will continue to see this strategy arise throughout this series. After Truman approved Operation Paper in late 1950, the Office of Policy Coordination got to work creating a convincing front to mask US involvement with Li Mi's army. The first step of Operation Paper was in creating an ideal vector for US funds and military equipment to flow to the guerrilla forces of Li Mi. The CIA tapped Paul Helliwell. To accomplish this task, Helliwell got to work creating a shell company called Sea Supply Corporation. The American incorporated firm set up by Helliwell opened an office in Bangkok and assigned two agency men to head the operation. Hong Kong CIA station chief Alfred Cox, the man who wrote the history piece I highlighted earlier, and the man who would become the head CIA man at Civil Air Transport, the new airline the CIA had purchased, and former OSS Detachment 101 agent Sherman Joost, who would head Sea Supply Corporation on Helliwell's behalf in Thailand. Sherman Joost had risen in prominence during the war for leading guerrilla armies in Burma, which made him a perfect fit for the operation. Once in Bangkok, the CIA men reconnected with another old OSS China colleague, a man named Willis Bird, which I have to admit has to be one of the best names so far in this series. Willis Bird ran an import-export business under the World Commerce Corporation out of Bangkok after the war, and was an ideal CIA contractor due to his previous intelligence experience. Sherman Joost would name Willis Bird's import-export firm as the general agent for Sea Supply Corp. This made sense, as Bird himself was the CIA's main point man in Bangkok. He was married to the daughter of a Thai Air Force officer and thus close to the Thai military brass, and through this capacity, Bird organized a Narasuan Council which essentially acted as a parallel forum outside of official U.S.-Thai diplomatic channels to work on joint policy. The Narasuan Council was made up of Willis Byrd, Sherman Joost, and most of the top Thai generals, including, most importantly, General Fao of the police force. Before working under Sea Supply Corp on Operation Paper, 
Willis Byrd was deeply involved in coordinating U.S. aid to Thailand, which as I stated earlier was largely focused on bolstering their counterinsurgency and security capabilities. Much of this aid was directed to General Fao, the head of the National Police, who was quickly kitted out with American-made military equipment. Willis Byrd's impact and influence in post-war Bangkok and in supplying arms to the police forces is relayed in a November 1951 diplomatic cable between U.S. Thai Embassy Officer William Turner to to Robert Joyce at the policy planning staff at the State Department. In the cable, Turner notes that a mysterious Mr. Willis Byrd was sharing top secret memos with the Thai chief of police, and that in June of that year, Byrd had been involved in an incident where he handed over, quote, a lot of military equipment to the police, end quote, who was under General Fao. U.S. support allowed Fao to create the Thai Border Police, which was a distinct unit focused solely on defending the northern border, and even an aerial police recon unit with a small fleet of planes. Fao's Thai Border Police got to be so militarized and so well equipped that it soon eclipsed Thailand's conventional armed forces under General Sarit. Fao's police force had grown to such strength in post-war Thailand that Prime Minister Phibun would later worry that the U.S. was positioning Fao to overthrow his government. Ironically, it would be General Sarit, the head of the armed forces in Bangkok, who would end up overthrowing the Phibun government in 1958, but we're getting off track. In 1951, Fao was promoted by his father-in-law to the position of Director of the National Police. In his new role, and with newly provided American equipment, Fao's paramilitary force was able to secure the northeastern borderlands with Burma, and in turn controlled the dope flow from the Golden Triangle to Bangkok. His men helped transport the goods to the Bangkok opium dens and shipyards under the veil of anti-narcotics work. Burmese intelligence officers also reported seeing unmarked C-46 and C-47s conducting at least five parachute drops a week in early 1951. The weapons were then, according to a later testimony by General Lee Mi, personally delivered by General Fao's forces to the Thai-Burmese border. From there, Lee Mi allegedly traded the weapons for fresh poppies, which were trafficked back to Bangkok for refining and were either consumed in the many opium dens of Bangkok or shipped out to other parts of the world. As Operation Paper got underway, Lee Mi's forces got further entrenched in the Burmese highlands, building permanent training facilities and flying military advisors from Taiwan and CIA advisors from Bangkok. As his forces expanded to nearly 4,000 men, in June 1951, Lee Mi ordered a detachment of men under the National Salvation Army to storm across the border into the border state of Yunnan in China. The men were successful at first, moving northward and capturing a Chinese airbase approximately 60 miles into the country. Shortly thereafter, Chinese PLA forces counterattacked, and Lee Mi's forces were once again forced to retreat back to Burma, after suffering serious casualties. As the situation escalated in eastern Burma, the American embassy in Rangoon began to raise concerns voiced by the local leadership about the ongoing KMT incursion. On August 15, 1951, U.S. Ambassador to Burma David Key sent a memo to Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, Dean Rusk. Notice Dean Rusk here, who would later be one of the architects of the Vietnam War, as Secretary of State under both the JFK and Johnson administrations. Anyways, Ambassador Key claims in this memo that the KMT troops in Keng Tun and Wa, the eastern states of Burma, have now, quote, suffered severe reverses at hands of Chinese commies and are retreating in disorder into Burmese territory, end quote. He follows this up by stating that a local leader in the east of the country was, quote, greatly agitated over the extremely serious situation developing in his state as a result of present behavior of KMT remnants who, though previously fairly well disciplined and willing to make some payment for supplies, were now becoming very unruly and indulging in outright looting. Other Burmese sources report KMT troops also selling arms to insurgents, end quote. From this correspondence, we can see that Operation Paper was becoming a diplomatic crisis, as American-supported insurgents were causing mayhem within a neutral, sovereign state. Despite this fact and the potential embarrassment that the situation could cause, the CIA decided to increase their support of the contingent force into late 1951 and early 1952, supplying the necessary equipment and materials for the KMT forces 
forces to build a Bush airstrip in Burma with the help of American engineers. The newly built airstrip allowed the civil air transport planes to fly to and from Bangkok and Taiwan, delivering more men and equipment. In November, according to McCoy, Lee Mi flew back to Taiwan and returned with a CAT airlift of 700 Taiwanese irregulars to reinforce his army. In August 1952, Lee Mi made his final legitimate attempt at invading Yunnan. 2,100 troops this time stormed across China's southern border and were again met with fierce resistance and forced to retreat. Operation Paper by this point had become a massive diplomatic headache for Washington, and according to an interview with Lee Mi in 1953, official aid from the US ended in July 1952. Although Operation Paper was a relatively short-lived exercise and failed in its stated objective of reinvading China, the operation gained a life of its own in late 1952. The final chapter of this obscure story will focus on the fallout of Operation Paper and how it succeeded in ways that may not have been anticipated by Truman when he signed the operation into action in 1950. As U.S. aid dwindled to a halt in mid-1952, Lee Mi's army was forced to remain in Burma, where they spread out across the Shan state and established themselves as the main governors of the region. During the period, Burma was incredibly unstable, dealing with several guerrilla movements at once. With American military equipment and new installations, the KMT forces were able to entrench themselves without much issue. By the end of 1952, Lee Mi's KMT forces had occupied the Shan state, where the men began to fraternize with locals and integrate themselves into the communities. Remember, the men of the 93rd Division were mostly Hoi people, a Muslim ethnic group that was present in both Yunnan and Shan, as well as across the entire Golden Triangle. Therefore, the men in the contingent force integrated into these Hoi communities in Shan and were able to assimilate easily and reignite the Shan opium trade. For the Hoi people of Yunnan and Shan, poppy cultivation was historically their main industry, as the mountains of the Golden Triangle were well suited to the cash crop, and little else. Many of Li Mi's men subsequently married local Shan women as the KMT Breakaway Division established themselves as the new governors of the region. In order to sustain their army, Li Mi's forces worked to expand the opium production capabilities in the region. Despite the end of U.S. aid, the guerrilla army was still dependent on military equipment and supplies delivered through Thailand by General Fao's Thai Border Patrol. Fao himself was lining his pockets through this lucrative business deal, picking up weapons from the still active Sea Supply Corporation, bringing them to the Thai-Burma border, and exchanging them for freshly cultivated opium that would make its way to the refineries and dens in Bangkok. This would later be revealed in 1955, when Thai Prime Minister Phibun reprimanded General Fao for awarding himself a $1 million reward for seizing 20 tons of opium on the Thai-Burma border. Fao would later rebuke this by claiming that the opium was from Burmese origins and belonged to the KMT. This narco trade route is outlined in no uncertain terms in another diplomatic memo from September 2, 1952, from Ambassador William J. Sebald. I am going to read a paragraph from the memo because it is so revealing. Sebald states in the memo, in no uncertain terms, that, quote, the natural trade routes supplying the Shan state where KMT troops have been based run southward into Thailand. The Shan states have traditionally been a source of opium. The KMT commanders soon become involved in the opium trade with Thailand as a source of funds. Movement of opium into Thailand and of supplies north from Thailand has proceeded with apparent tacit approval of the Thai authorities, probably also with their connivance and to their profit. Involvement of Thai authorities and the activities of officials of the Chinese embassy in Bangkok on behalf of the KMT troops in Burma are common gossip in Bangkok. The visibility in Bangkok of the Taiwan connection with the KMTs in Upper Burma led Burmese authorities repeatedly to approach the United States government with requests that pressure be brought on Taiwan to remove the KMT troops." End quote. Sebald essentially lays out Operation Paper in full within this memo. Most importantly is his recommendation that the US push Taiwan to remove their troops from Burma, although the KMT troops would not leave Burma for almost another decade. So long story short, over the next decade, Burma and later the US would continue to pressure Chiang Kai-shek and the government in Taipei to evacuate Li Mi's occupying force in Shan, the same force that they had just supported for nearly two years. The issue would even be raised at the United Nations in March of 1953, where the Chinese nationalist government was charged with quote, unprovoked aggression. 
and by April 1953, an official UN resolution was passed urging Taiwan to withdraw their troops. Following this blunder, the United States convened a four-nation commission in Bangkok with Burmese, Thai, Taiwanese, and American representatives. The talks stalled after a month, and Limi's forces stayed put, sustained by their newly developed opium economy and weapons from the Thais. In September of 1953, the Taiwanese finally agreed to airlift 2,000 men from Burma to Taiwan. Civil air transport planes were contracted to evacuate the men out of the jungle and back to Taiwan. Over the next 11 months, another 5,700 troops and Li Mi himself would evacuate Burma, reuniting with the nationalists in Taiwan. But as McCoy put it, the CIA was to learn that installing the KMT in Burma was much easier than withdrawing them. Over the next years, sporadic evacuations would take place, but many of the fighters from the original Hui contingent of forces would remain in Shan, occupying the opium fields and profiting from the booming drug trade. As an interesting aside, for a short period between 1953 and 1954, former director of the OSS, Wild Bill Donovan, was appointed as US ambassador to Thailand. And during the late 1940s, Donovan had actually established himself as an insider in Thai political circles after the war. According to McCoy again, Donovan told Willis Byrd to contact the future CIA when he saw an opening for covert American support. So Donovan's appointment as Thai ambassador is not too surprising, yet it does raise questions about how serious the United States was about the withdrawal of Lee Mi's forces. Another eyebrow-raising coincidence was that during this period, the Thai government held a consular office in Paul Heliwell's law firm offices in Miami. I want you all to think for a second, why did Thailand, a Southeast Asian country an ocean away from the United States, require a consulate in, of all places, Miami, Florida? Seems random enough at first glance, but it's strange occurrences such as these that display the subtle linkages of the French connection. This Thai consulate in Miami represents in a way the full circle of the French connection, from Southeast Asia, through Europe in Marseille, all the way back to the United States, and Miami more specifically. As we get to the end of this series, you will hopefully be able to see why Miami was such an important milieu in this connection. But we are getting ahead of ourselves, let's stay on topic. Finally, throughout the mid to late 1950s, Burma conducted offensives against the intruding force in the east, and in May of 1959, Burmese forces captured a KMT facility at Wonton. There they found three morphine refineries next to an active airstrip. Operation Paper had truly gained a life of its own, with Lee Mi's men running the whole operation and continuing their guerrilla activities completely independently of US aid. Yet on January 26, 1961, almost exactly a decade after the initiation of Operation Paper, the final bastion of organized KMT troops were overwhelmed by a joint army of Burmese and Chinese Communist troops in the Shan province. Although Li Mi's lost army had been defeated in Burma, the men simply retreated into neighboring Laos. Many of the Hoi people remained in Burma and reorganized under a young up-and-coming warlord named Kun Sa. The Chinese Burmese Kun Sa would eventually be known as the King of Opium for his stranglehold of the poppy fields of Shan. And Kun Sa remains one of the most famous figures of the Golden Triangle drug trade and remained in power in Shan until the mid-1990s. Although many documentaries have been made about Kun Sa, few speak of his origins under the CIA-funded troops of General Li Mi. Interestingly, the US's secret war in Laos would pick up around the same time that the nationalist forces were routed in 1961, and incidentally, some KMT forces would reportedly assimilate with the local Hmong forces, who were recipients of CIA aid in Laos throughout the 1960s. Burma had finally been rid of Operation Paper, but the guerrilla forces persisted, largely thanks to the opium trade. So in all, that is the often untold story of Operation Paper. I wanted to highlight this episode of CIA history because this small-scale operation in the hills of Burma would represent the blueprint for the future decades of covert operations undertaken by the CIA. Firstly, Operation Paper was a failure in its main objective, but succeeded in a much more nuanced and devious way. The short-lived injection of support to Li Mi's troops and the CIA's bolstering of the Thai Border Patrol allowed the breakaway KMT troops to sustain themselves long after their official American support had ended. In this case, and as will be the case across the world from Nicaragua to Afghanistan to Laos, the narcotics trade became a secret and self-sustaining funding model for a foreign-supported insurgency movement, completely off the books and off the records. 
Secondly, we can observe the novel use of a second state, in this case, Thailand, as a stepping stone to the real operation in the target state, here Burma and ultimately Communist China. This client state strategy would be used effectively in other narco-fueled operations, such as Honduras and Costa Rica as stepping stones to Nicaragua in the 1980s, and Pakistan as a stepping stone to Afghanistan throughout the entire 30-year conflict. Using a secondary state to do the dirty work allows an additional layer of plausible deniability for the agents and agencies involved. Finally, the use of a proprietary firm such as Civil Air Transport and Sea Supply Corp ensured that the operations could continue to function without official American involvement, as these seemingly private firms were able to continue to operate beyond the end of officially sanctioned missions. Therefore, in conclusion, Operation Paper represents the blueprint for what I call narco counterinsurgency. A strategy based on using narco-fueled armies that remain off the books to fight secret wars that are unauthorized without any need for continued US tax dollars to proceed. And with that, that is all I have for today, folks. I want to start off by thanking you so much for watching and for your patience in waiting for this next part. I want to start off by thanking my patrons, as always, for their ongoing support. Uh, your ongoing trust in my work means a ton to me, and you have really helped me to step up my production quality on this show with this new audio gear and a ton of books that I would otherwise not have picked up. So thank you so much. Patrons actually receive this video one week early. So if you would like to receive the next part and all other parts one week early, there is a link to my patreon below it helps me out it's only five dollars a month to get uh, that early access and it's very appreciated as for the next part of this series we will be remaining in southeast asia moving this time to the first indochina war in vietnam and laos during this period the french were fighting a brutal colonial war against insurgent forces across their colony we will be exploring the counterinsurgency methods implemented by the french and how the americans picked up the pieces of the narco counterinsurgency network left behind when they entered vietnam shortly after after the French defeat. As always, thank you so much for the support. A like goes a long way in helping in the algorithm, and I still try to read all the comments, so I would love to hear your thoughts down below. Anything I might have missed, uh, any extra insights, always much appreciated. So that's all for today, but as always, remember to keep your eyes wide open. Take care.